What's up guys? This is Nish and after watching this video you're going to know everything there is to know about Double Sword. We're going to master the logic, write the code and even prove the time complexity mathematically. So let's go. At this point I'm going to ask you to pause the video and take this test array of 3, 2, 9 and 1 and really think about if you had to write a sorting algorithm, how would you go about doing it? So pause the video and Take your time to think about it, write some pseudocode, maybe write some code and then come back to this. Wonderful. So now that you're back, let's jump into the solution. Bubble sort is one of the simplest sorting algorithms there is. All it does is iterate through the list multiple times while comparing each element to its neighbor and putting it into its right order. That's all it does. 3, 2, 9 and 1. And we begin with the first position. So element 3 is compared to its neighbor, which is 2. 3 is greater than 2, so we swap them because 2 obviously needs to be before 3. And so we get the new array 2, 3, 9, and 1. Now 3 is then compared to its new neighbor, which is 9. Is 3 greater than 9? No, it's not. So the order of the position seems right for now. And so we make no changes. In the next iteration, we compare 9 to 1. Is 9 greater than 1? Yes, it is. So we come to the final iteration of the inner loop, which puts it nine in the last position. This is just one cycle. And after the end of one cycle, we can confidently say, and this is something you might have noticed, that the largest element in the list bubbles down to its rightful position. So we know for a fact right now that nine, largest element, has been bubbled down to the last element. And this essentially is bubble sort. All bubble sort does is it bubbles down the elements to their rightful positions. This is the most fun part. Uh, so what we're gonna do is sort this list in descending order. I just want to remind you guys that this is how the list is indexed. The first position is starts from zero, one, two, three. So thinking through how we're gonna implement this algorithm, we know for a fact that we have to not only go through this list once, but multiple times. So we know that there are some for loops that are gonna be involved in this operation. So I'm going to write this pseudo code over here. Um, so we begin with i is equal to zero, i is less than n, where n is the length of the list, and i plus plus. And we know that just one loop is not going to be enough because this is one pass of the list and this does not look sorted. So there definitely has to be another loop inside here. Let's name that j and Let's begin by having j go through all the way till n as well. And we make this more efficient later. So after going through the logic of the algorithm, we know that when we start with the first index, we what we want to do is compare it to its neighbor. So since the inner loop is the one that's going to be run multiple times, we can use the index uh, using the element j. And what we can do is compare it, right? If the first element, which it starts with in position zero, if array, this is what I'm calling the array, at index j, which begins from zero, is greater than its neighbor. So what is the neighbor of j? j plus one, right? So if it's greater than its neighbor, j plus one, then we want to swap them. But hold up, there's an issue over here. Since we have this as j plus one, what's going to happen now is that the inner loop is going all the way till the last element. So by the time we reach the last element and this is j, we're inevitably going to get an index out of bounds error because j plus one doesn't exist. And when we try to access that in the array, it's going to break our code. So this is a simple solution. All we need to do is have j go till n minus 1 because if it goes to n minus 1, j can only get here and j plus 1 would be the last element. So that solves that problem. And now if this is true, if, the for, if j is greater than j plus 1, so obviously they are not in the right order if we're sorting the list in the descending order, we can just swap them. Swapping is quite simple as well. We can assign a temp variable as the value at position j and then reassign the value at position j to be the one at j plus one 
right? And then similarly at j plus 1, all we need to do is put the temp variable back. And this is it. Bubble sort is solved. It's that simple. We know that we have to bubble down the elements and this series of nested loops with the if statement will sort the array for us. But we're not satisfied because we can still make this better. And there are a couple of ways, right? We'll start off with the most basic one. Let's take a look again at the algorithm. We spoke about how we know for a fact that after the first iteration of the inner loop, the largest element, if you're sorting in descending order, comes to its rightful position, which is the last position. And this keeps happening because what's gonna happen in the next pass of the entire inner loop is that three is gonna get compared to one and they're gonna get swapped. So one is gonna come here, three is gonna come here, and nine is gonna remain where it was. So one and three get swapped and the second largest element in this list comes to its rightful position. And in the next iteration, two and one get compared, so one and two get swapped, three remains in its correct position, and nine remains in its correct position. And so what we can notice here is that on the first iteration, we have to go through the entire list. But once that happens, we know for a fact that the largest element is in its rightful position. So all we need to do is go through the first three elements, right? Because we don't need to touch this. This is in its right position. And after this iteration happens, all we need to do is go through these two because now three is in its right position and then so on and so forth. So you can see the size of the array that we are iterating through keeps de decreasing after one entire pass of the entire array. So this can also be implemented easily. And what we can do is, if we wanna continue the same behavior, we can have n begin from n minus one position. And I'll explain why we're doing this shortly. So just bear with me here and have n go through the reverse order. It's still gonna go through the same number of iterations, it's just going through the reverse order. And why we're doing this is because now j can go through the same order, but instead of j being less than n minus one, meaning that instead of j going through the entire list on every uh, kind of iteration of the inner loop, what it can do is it can only go to i. And why this solves it is because in the beginning, i is gonna be three. And so j is gonna go from zero to three. The size of i decreases and we get two. And so j will go from zero to two. And i decreases again, zero to one, and then zero. And so we can see that j is now iterating through smaller portions of the list, which is exactly what we want. So this solves it for us. But another thing is that we can make it more efficient. Because what happens if you get a list that is, I guess, slightly unsorted? Because this is all more sorted, right? What's gonna happen is after the first pass of the entire inner loop, the list is gonna be sorted because three and two get swapped. But because the algorithm doesn't know that, it's gonna keep iterating through the entire list multiple times, even though it's already sorted. So how do we take advantage of that fact? Well, another way to think about this is that if we go through the entire inner loop and not one element gets swapped, we know that every element is in its rightful position. If no element is swapped, one is compared to two, correct position, two is compared to two, correct position, two is compared to three, correct position, now no one is gonna get swapped. And so we know for a fact that the array is sorted. And this again is a simple implementation that we can add. Let's add a variable saying number of swaps, right? And assign it to zero. We assign it inside the outer loop and I'll explain why in a second. So we assign swap to be zero and this is the only portion of the code where swaps happen. So if a swap does happen, we can increment the value at variable swap. And at the end of this, we can check 
if swap is still equal to zero, get the fuck out of this list because it is already sorted. We don't need to do anything else. And this will also be inside the, sorry, this will also be outside the entire inner loop, but it will still be inside the outer loop. So here's what's gonna happen, right? On every outer loop iteration, swap gets assigned the value zero. Then we begin with the inner loop. The inner loop compares each element to its neighbor. If no swaps happen, which means swap is never incremented, swap still has a value of zero. And that's what we're checking over here. If swap is equal to zero, we just get out of here. We don't need to do any more iterations after this because we know the list is already sorted. So here we have it. This is as efficient as bubble sort can probably get. And it's, it's really good because in the worst case scenario, our time complexity is still O of n squared. But with the implementation of this counter over here, our best case scenario when we get an all a sorted list, um, that our time complex, complexity is going to be O of n. We're going to mathematically prove the time complexity for the algorithm that we've just written. Um, I'm gonna say that right now, the big O that we have in front of us is for this algorithm is n squared. And side note, um, I'm not going to go deep into what, what big O and omega are and how they function. I will we'll do a video for that soon. Um, so the prerequisites are that you have some sort of an understanding of how big O works. And um, essentially, if you look at the algorithm, we can kind of intuitively tell that it's gonna be n squared because the outer loop goes um, through n iterations, right? And the inner loop goes through at most n iterations, um, about n minus two because j is less than i and i is 10 minus one. But anyways, it comes up to be n squared. But let's prove this mathematically so we know for sure, right? So we know the outer loop, <coughs> the number of iterations it goes through is zero to n minus one, which is n iterations because if you take the example of the last area we were working with, the n was four. So if i starts from three and goes all the way down to zero, it'll go from three, two, one, zero, which is four iterations, right? So that gives us n. And then the inner loop, this is where it gets exciting, goes from zero to i. Ah, and so the value of i changes after the uh, entire run of the outer loop. And so we gotta account for that, right? Because now what happens is that the inner loop runs for the first time, it will run one less than n minus one times because i is n minus one and j is less than n minus one, so it will run n minus two times. Then the next time it will run n minus three times, then n minus four, and then so on and so forth until we have n minus n, so that's zero iterations, right? And the reason this is so is because now we don't have to take into account the outer loop and then multiply, say like n times um, the entire product of this because since j is already taking into account i, um, the first iteration of the entire loop will have this code run n minus two times. Then it will have it run n minus three times, then n minus four times, and then n minus n times. And I hope that makes sense. Um, so what we're trying to prove with um, time complexity right now is that how many times is this block of code, which is inside the inner loop, going to run, right? And so with i starting with n minus one and j being less than i, it will the first time the inner loop runs, this block of code will run n minus two times, then n minus three times, then n minus four times. And that's why we are adding these together because we want to know the total number of iterations, right? Um, that's what the goal is to understand how good or bad or how efficient our algorithm is, is how many times does this piece of code run? So this can also be written as zero because n minus n is at some point zero. 
from die only, all right? And then the element right before n minus one would run one time. The one before that would run two times. So on and so forth until it runs n minus two times. Make sense? So if our n is small, that's easy to do, right? If it's four, then we know if we go from zero, one, two, three, plus four, that'll give us 10. But for large values of n, we can't really do that. And so this, mathematically speaking, is why we have the sigma notation, all right? So don't get scared of this, but sigma notation essentially says that if we have a variable k and it starts from zero and it goes all the way till n minus two, then this, all it denotes is what the value of zero plus one plus two plus three all the way to n minus two will be, which will then be assigned to k, right? As simple as that. So all this is saying is a short form of explaining this right here. And someone has already come up with a closed form solution for this. So this closed form solution for this is n times n plus one by two. So if we had four elements, you would plug four into n and the result would be 10, same as four plus three plus two plus one plus zero. And in this case, our n is n minus two. So what this comes down to is this being n minus two times n minus two plus one divided by two. Beautiful. And this will result in n minus two times n minus two plus one will be n squared minus three n plus three divided by two. And all the big O looks for is what is the variable with the highest order of growth? So when we are plotting this, what is going to cause the highest order of growth for this growth for, for the slope of the line for the number of iterations of how many times the algorithm is going to run um, is going to be. And so that's going to be n squared. So our big O is O of n squared. And so if it kind of bugged you why minus three n was not accounted for in calculating the actual O of n squared, you need to take a look deeper into how big O works and I will do a video for that shortly. So this is it guys. Uh, we went through the concept of bubble sort. We went through the logic, we wrote the code, we made it more efficient, and we also proved the time complexity. So this is pretty much everything you need to know about how and what bubble sort is, um, or how it functions. But yeah, it was fun. And please subscribe to this channel. I will be posting a lot more videos. This is just the beginning. There's so many more cool sorting algorithms out there. What I do need from you is that, please drop down a comment of what you felt about this tutorial. Post any questions in the comments as well. Uh, I will post a link to the GitHub, which has this code, so you can kind of play around with it. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you did like the video, give it a thumbs down, so I know. Mention it, so I can make my future videos better, and tell me why. I'll see you guys next time.